Coming up on Colonial Crossfire, the midterm elections. Ballot measures. And DC politics. Joining us on the left, Eric Wolfert. On the right, Emily Jashinsky. And I'm your moderator, Kevin Fry. This is Colonial Crossfire. A new era in Washington. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Fry, and welcome to a special midterm edition of Colonial Crossfire. In a tidal wave of election victories on Tuesday night, Republicans gained at least seven seats in the U.S. Senate. They also easily maintained power in the House. That means that come January, the GOP will control both houses of the U.S. Congress, creating a divided government here in our nation's capital. Here at GW, the college Republicans and college Democrats gathered as the results came in on Tuesday night. They held neighboring viewing parties in the Marvin Center. Colonial Crossfire reporters Mike Falco and Benji Englander were there as the votes were counted. After months of volunteering on campaigns, college Democrats gathered to watch the results roll in. Meanwhile, down the hall, the college Republicans celebrated a night of victory after their own campaign efforts. G -O -P! G -O -P! I think we're going to get to put legislation on the president's desk and force him to sign it or veto it. And then come 2016, people will see the repercussions of him either vetoing or signing legislation that the Congress has passed and make their decision, hopefully, for a Republican president in 2016. I think that the main thing you're going to see is Obama is going to be forced to veto a lot of legislation, um, which uh, is going to be kind of a difficult situation for the Democrats, obviously. But I think that um, personally, I'm not too pessimistic about it because I think that it means that people are going to get a real clear idea of where the Republican Party stands. actually going out into the field, knocking on doors and talking to people about what matters to them really lets you see the impact that this election will have. And it was a really cool experience to be able to do that. It's awesome. Uh, you know, last year it was great when we got to campaign for Chris Christie to see him win by a huge margin. And this year, I think it's going to be really great to see the fruits of our labor pay off uh, when we hopefully take back the Senate. All right, thanks to Mike and Benji. To take a closer look at the midterm results, we're now joined by our student panel. On the left, Eric Wolfert, a junior from Scarsdale, New York, majoring in political science. Eric is a member of both the College Democrats and the Roosevelt Institute. On the right, Emily Jashinsky, a senior from Milwaukee, studying political science and creative writing. She serves as president of GW's Young America's Foundation. Thank you both so much for joining us. Back in 2010, President Obama called the midterms a shellacking. Four years later, the Republican landslide continued. They had a seven-seat gain in the Senate, and they could get at least one more seat. The race for the Louisiana Senate seat will go to a runoff in December. President Obama addressed the Democrats' defeat in a speech the day after the election. So to everyone who voted, I want you to know that I hear you. All right, Eric, so my question to you, what was the message that Obama was hearing? What's the message of this election? Um, well, I think it's two-pronged, actually. The first is, and without sounding like I'm trying to make excuses, the map was very unfavorable to Democrats this year. It was a number of Senate seats that were won by Democrats in 2008, which, as we all know, was a very, very was an excellent Democratic year. And there, are, um, needless to say, in a midterm election with a Democratic president, it's going to be hard for Democrats to win in places like Arkansas and Louisiana, um, and and such. Um, that being said, I think there are a couple of lessons that Democrats um, can learn from this. The first one is to not take anything for granted. Uh, as we saw in a couple of the gubernatorial races in deep blue states like Maryland or Massachusetts or Illinois, 
um, a lot of our candidates just coasted. They took it, they took it for granted. They assumed that the state that the state's natural lean would carry them. They avoid ta they avoided talking about more substantive issues. While um, Republicans such as Larry Hogan or Charlie Baker um, uh, ran a, ran a very good campaign. Was substantive. I want Emily. I want to bring these uh, these governor sure, elections yeah. to you because this was some of these were rather shocking. Yeah, absolutely. It seems. So it, I'm I'm going to guess that you have a different message that the voters were sending to these elected officials. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the explanation that there was some measure of complacency involved doesn't actually really hold up because I think the best case study really is my home state of Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin is not a red state. Yet Scott Walker took that election by five points. So I think you have to look that a, a little deeper, and I think really the message is this was a referendum on President Obama. So I mean, I think we have to be careful with some of those other explanations. Do you agree with that? Um, to, so, to some extent. I mean, I think at the same time, while yes, Wisconsin is not a red state, Scott Walker is still a Republican incumbent, um, a Republican incumbent uh, running in a midterm election with a Democratic president. But then what about, for instance, Maryland, where uh, Larry, Larry Hogan beat incumbent Governor Martin O'Malley? Uh, that he was not the incumbent. It was Anthony Brown was oh, the sorry. Democratic nominee. I but I, wow. back to my further point about complacency, that would be an example of that. I think Anthony Brown ran a very unsubstantive campaign. Um, I think that he very much took it for granted. Maryland is one of the most democratic states in our country. Um, he really avoided talking about some of the more me meaty issues, so to speak. And I give a lot of credit to Larry Hogan. Who was yeah, I think that's where the real credit is. I don't necessarily know that the Democrats ran a poor campaign. I think they ran an average campaign in a lot of these states, it's if not the above Republicans average. Money. It's that the Republicans actually, to their credit, had a really fantastic message. I mean, they, their messaging was on point well, this election. And I want to get back to that messaging because the, there's seemingly Obama admitted in this press conference there right. is a message that he is being told. And what is that message that is kind of going to Obama? The message that's going to Obama is that there, people are looking for change, and that's the message of every election. Um, and particularly and a midterm this far into a presidential term. So exactly. So it's shocking. No, it, I mean, it shouldn't be shocking to any of us mm -hmm. when you look. And that's something that I think is really important is that we kind of surprised ourselves because the media hasn't accurately been capturing the mood of the American people. So these things shouldn't necessarily be a surprise to us. 2010 shouldn't necessarily have been a surprise to us. But we look at the electorate and we don't necessarily evaluate them ac accurately, and that's what happened. I want to look at one of the Senate races. Obviously, we've seen seven victories for the, <coughs> excuse me, the Republicans, but one more that l may possibly come in December, which is uh, Mary Landrieu. Right being defeated, likely, by the Republican candidate in Louisiana. Anything to read into all of this, Eric? Um, I would say, uh, for that, that case, um, that's just a, typic that's a typical six-year age. Louisiana is significantly more conservative than when Mary Landrieu first took office in, in 2002. She survived a very, very close race in 2008. Well, she's very much an embattled candidate that's been, yeah. that's been successful in overcoming these, these yes. problems. Yes, and in, in two th 2008, despite it being an excellent Democratic year, she still escaped by a very, very narrow margin. Um, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I have been I've been pegging her for defeat uh, ever since the cycle started. Yeah. She's going to have a tough election. I mean, uh, what people aren't talking about is the fact that there was a Tea Party candidate in and that, that race that and won And likely all of points. those votes are going to go. Yeah, there's to the a, Republicans. no Tea Partiers. They're like, oh man, I think it's time to vote <laughs> for Mary Landrieu. For Mary Landrieu, I can yeah. see that happening. Yeah. Um, and One getting Democratic turnout a second time is going to be very difficult. Right, and particularly yeah. in December, obviously. Yeah. It, it, it yeah. was basically pegged that if she didn't win this time, there's no chance she's going to win this next time. They're, they're already going to come to the polls. They're yeah. already taking money out of the race. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unfor unfortunately, I have to agree with you. Yeah. All right, so a little bit more of a cultural respect now. We have two kind of significant cultural elections, uh, if you will. Uh, Representative Mia Love, or future Representative Mia Love, first African-American woman in Congress in Utah's 4th District. Is there, is there significance to this, that there is now an African-American female who's on the Republican ticket in Congress? Well, f absolutely. I mean, I think that the Republicans have had such a hard time chipping away at the media's narrative that they're the party of old white men. And I just think it's going to be very difficult for the media to spin it any differently now that we're actually evolving and the Republicans have taken seriously people's criticisms of them. Albeit with, albeit with one, one seat. Well, yeah, I mean, there's also Tim Scott, who's right. fantastic, and there are a number of other uh, really sort of diverse members elected in this cycle. I mean, mm -hmm. I can name one person I, in Ohio. Well, I, I actually, for you, Eric, I actually have to disagree. I disagree with you that it's media spin. I mean, just look at the numbers from the 2012 election, and s ever since 19 1996 and 2000, every group that, quite frankly, is not old white men has been trending away from the Republicans. We note his we note Hispanics quite a bit, but we um, women, Asian Americans. Um, African Americans sure. who have always been a Democratic stronghold are even more more so than they were 15 years ago. I, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you can't argue with those numbers. But yeah. the point of the matter, you, you can't assume 
that the Democratic Party is the party of all African Americans. You when can't assume now, when there are now cases. Exactly, studies. and now what we can do is better appeal to different demographics because it'll be harder for the media to spin it otherwise. Because there are arguments for African Americans to, you know, join the Republican Party. So it's positive. And that's going to be our final word on the analysis of the actual elections themselves. But with a divided government, we now look to the future. What will the next two years look like? We'll ask our panel when we come back after this break. Stay with us. It's been pretty busy around here with parcel and flex plans going on sale, so we need an extra pair of hands around the office. Let's go, g -Dub. Let's go, g -Dub. We had no idea he would bring the Colonial Army. Whoosh! Ah, uh, g Ah, uh, hey, hey, George, uh, I think you have an update for Firefox. Never mind. <laughs> Welcome back to our discussion of the midterms. In speeches a day after the election, President Obama and future Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, at least he's projected to be, gave perhaps a preview of what it will look like in the next two years. Uh, when the American people choose divided government, I don't think it means they don't want us to do anything. I think it means they want us to look for areas of agreement. We can surely find ways to work together on issues where there's broad agreement among the American people. So, Emily, you just heard the word agreement pop up in both of those speeches. Is there something that be, can be agreed upon? Absolutely, and I hope it's tax reform. <laughs> I, I really hope it's tax reform. Uh, I think on a more micro level, you're going to see the medical device tax uh, be eliminated from Obamacare, but there are certainly a number of issues, hopefully tax reform, that the people just uh, will all be able to agree on. I want to go through issue by issue and look at some of the things that will likely come up in the next two years, per se or maybe not at all, but we'll see if there, what your opinions are on this. So immigration. Obama is now vowing to do an executive order to remove the threat of deportation and grant work permits um, uh, to uh, immigrants. But Boehner and Con both Boehner and McConnell say that this is going to be poison in the well. So is there any chance, Eric, of Congress doing anything on this, or is this just going to be an executive action? Uh, absolutely not. And I would strongly encourage President Obama, not that he's listening, of course, but I would, I would strongly encourage President Obama to not take this bait um, Boehner and McConnell once again are just trying to intimidate him. We've, we've seen it time and again. The bipartisan Senate bill passed with well more than a supermajority in June 2013. Um, the House has refused to even consider it, despite the fact that there are several House Republicans that are in favor of it. So I would say to President Obama, don't take this bait. I would, I would be going with an executive action at this but point. But if he takes the executive action, this poison in the well mm -hmm. sort of thing, would this be the end of any possible working relationship if he takes an advancement on this in the coming weeks? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, if he's taking an executive action on that sort of level, uh, not only is that poisoning the well in terms of Congress's relationship with the president, that's he. That's going to be poisoning the well in terms of public opinion on the president. But, that's going to be a, but what, a serious. But what well was there even to poison? Ever since two thousand eight, the Republicans, the well. <laughs> <laughs> the Repu Republicans since two thousand eight have shown no interest in working with the president really on any substantive issue. We have Mitch McConnell, who in January of okay, two thousand and nine well. <laughs> said that their sing single biggest priority was making President Obama a one-term president. I think pre one of President Obama's biggest mistakes has been ever thinking that there was any compromise in this party. Uh. Uh, <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Obviously, I disagree with that. I mean, I would say if you're looking at immigration in particular, they haven't put it on their agenda. Right, and I think the the concept I'm talking about here is more executive action. Right, and that has been massively unpopular with the American people. Is President Obama taking executive action? And I think that's one of the serious issues that public opinion was so negative. But don't Republicans about. take the risk? I mean, you have uh, these immigration uh, organizations trying to get the president to do something. Absolutely. Wouldn't, wouldn't the, the Republicans take a risk by not actually acting upon this for, for instance, 2016? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a serious cost-benefit analysis that they need to take up, and I'm sure they're doing all kinds of calculations on what their move should be on that particular issue, because movement on that could certainly be really problematic for some people going forward into 2016. It could also be problematic to not do anything. You're right. Another topic that we could possibly see, God only knows, is Obamacare coming up. <laughs> Emily, we we've seen that. The, the, yeah. the Ted Cruz effect. Is there a chance of this coming again, this repeal in full? Um, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable for them to sort of symbolically pass repeal in both the House and the Senate. Even if nothing can actually happen. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's unreasonable that they would do that um, because that is obviously, it's so unpopular that they can, it's, it's not, it's pandering to the American people and I don't think it's uh, impossible that that will happen, but the best thing that Mitch McConnell can do right now is make amends with Ted Cruz in whatever possible way. 
kind of wrangle him into a position where he's not going to sabotage their, I, I mean, they've really crafted a very, very sort of popular image. And, and there's really no chance, Eric, of this, of, uh, <laughs> President Obama will obviously veto anything uh, to, uh, to uh, pull apart Obamacare. But there are little portions of it that we could possibly see come up in the next two years. For instance, the 30-hour rule for uh, the terms of what it means to be a full-time employee. Do you think there could be some bending on some of those smaller issues like the 30-hour rule? Oh, absolutely. And I think there has uh, there has been already. In fact, Republicans have criticized the president for taking what they see as, you know, unilateral actions. You know, for example, um, delaying the um, I I employer mandate right. uh, in the Affordable Care Act. I do think that I do think that the president has been willing to make some amends in that regard, and I would imagine we're going to see more of that, whether it's unilateral or through Congress. Any agreement there, Emily? Yeah, I mean, I think it'll sort of be a uh, piecemeal chipping away at Obamacare. I don't think we're ever going to get rid of it at this point. Right, it's someone you know. embedded in the system yeah, at this point. Uh, next topic, Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans obviously are going to want to pass any legislation to get that uh, up and running. Is Obama going to be forced, Eric, to take this up? Uh, I think he will certainly be forced to make a decision. I mean, this is an issue that's been on the docket for... I mean, he's been stalling now yeah, with the this, State Department this and is, EPA. This is an issue that's been on the docket now for four or five years, and um, obviously it's very important and requires a very careful cost-benefit analysis, but I do think that it's time to... Emily, which is more costly for Obama, to uh, to accept it or to, to continue to veto it? To continue to veto it. I mean, I think all of the research shows that it's probably a very strong uh, move on his part to pass the... Keystone Pipeline legislation and get it over with and create some good jobs. At the same time, I don't think Republicans are, or I should say pro-Keystone lawmakers because there are some on both sides of the aisle, I don't think they're necessarily in any better shape after this election because plenty of the moderate Democrats such as Mark Pryor or Mary Landrieu that have been defeated or are look, look likely to soon be defeated um, were, in were in favor of this pipeline. I don't know that there's been, pretty much other than with the exception of Cory Gardner, that there's been an in increase in the number of pro-Keystone pre lawmakers. Uh, in the Senate. And yeah. with, with it's somewhat sticking on the topic mm -hmm. of environmentalism, it's likely that Jim Inhofe, uh, Senator Jim Inhofe <laughs> oh, of Oklahoma God. is going to be taking over the Environment and Public Works Senate Committee. What does this mean for the whole concept of, I don't know, global warming? Um, I, it's I, climate change, Kevin. Yeah. Climate change, I'm sorry. It's all in how you frame things. It really is. Emily? <laughs> Um, you no, go, you, you started. Uh, go ahead. You're um, so nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I um, I think it's a, I think it's a tra travesty. I mean, Jim Inhofe um, Jim Inhofe goes beyond what you would call skepticism, which I'm not convinced how much skepticism is warranted in the first place. But he he legitimately thinks that it is a big government hoax to steal your freedom. He has written a book to this effect. Emily, you're fuming. Um, I'm not fuming. I think it's funny. <laughs> he is, he is ri he's written a book to this effect and. Um, and I think he, I think he's tremendously unqualified for this. And I think then again, issues like cap and trade never, we're never getting any traction in the first place. So I, I think that's kind of a key point is that there has not been much mm -hmm. movement on climate change legislation for right. ten years, right. probably. So I mean, I'm if I were someone who's really concerned about climate change, which I'm not, I would be. Uh, you know, it doesn't make that much of a difference either way. Uh, I think you can lo probably look for executive action from President Obama on climate One change issues. Final thing I want to bring up, and we'll we kind of keep, try to keep this brief. What is the smart decision for Republicans in the next two years? Keeping this like one, two sentences. Is it smart for them to hold up everything, kind of the Ted Cruz effect, or is it smart for them to pass a bunch of things and say, look, we did all this work? Emily? Yeah, well, there's there was a poll that showed most Americans actually had no confidence in the Republicans' plan, um, less confident in the Republicans' plan than they did for President Obama's plan. So they need progress. They need to come out, tell the American people they have ideas, they have legislation, they're going to actually make change. And if they don't, 2016 could be a problem. <laughs> it will be a huge problem. What's the smart move? If I were a Republican strategist, I'd, Republican strategist, I'd be saying the exact same thing Emily is. Um, they can't, in 2016, they can't run as the anti-Obama party anymore. They need to actually do something because they're now in charge of both They houses. need to stand, stand, for, something. stand, stand for, for something. something. And that's something that we'll see if they define themselves in any regard in the next couple coming weeks. They've, they've begun to define themselves. It's wondering if what they'll pass and get done. All right, we're going to end this topic. Thank you for a very lively discussion. When we come back, we'll look at the ballot initiatives. Across the nation, the voters didn't just elect officials. They also made decisions on new state policies, including the minimum wage and legalization of marijuana. We'll tackle what those votes mean next. The George Washington University, at the intersection of policy, practice, and research. Connecting all that Washington has to offer with an intellectual environment that drives progress. Transforming vision into action, offering learning experiences that are rigorous, real-time, and real-world. 
in a city shaping the future. George Washington is a place where faculty and students don't just study the world, they work to change it. Welcome back. Our panel joins us again for Rapid Fire, some quick answers to some quick questions. Today we look at two of the ballot initiatives from across the country, starting with marijuana. Three states and the District of Columbia voted on legalizing recreational marijuana. The measure passed in Alaska, Oregon, and D.C. Voters in Florida narrowly missed the 60 percent necessary to pass the legislation. Eric, should this remain a state-by-state -state issue? Well, I think for the time being it's going to have to be. Um, I would certainly favor repeal of the Federal Controlled Substances Act, for pers well, at least as it relates to marijuana. I think we have seen now for several decades the deleterious effects of marijuana prohibition, just like we did with alcohol prohibition in the 1920s. Um, so I would say I think this is, I think this is great progress, and I, I look forward to a lot of states um, continuing down this path. I mean, if Alaska, Alaska, a state that no one will confuse with liberal, um, can do this, I think we can, we'll see a lot more. Is this starting a trend? I mean, I think the electorate is becoming more libertarian, um, and I also think it's positive. You would like that, wouldn't you? Of course I would. <laughs> the positive thing is that it's happening on a state-by-state -state level. The negative thing that we really need to pay attention to is sort of how the experiment has gone in Colorado, and I think there's a lot of evidence showing that it has not gone that well. Right. All right. Uh, we will see how this continues to pan out. Second topic, and I do want to say that what I just said was uh, legislation. It was a, 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 a vote, a, a ballot initiative across the public, whether or not they elected to do so. Uh, second topic, voters in four states elected to raise the minimum wage. They joined 13 other states that have elected to do so since 2013. Now it should be noted that in three of those new states, including Arkansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota, voters also elected Republican governors. So, Emily, is this a sign of a national trend? Yeah, I think this is really pushing the issue. Um, again, I don't really see this as a partisan issue because the research is pretty undecided on how the minimum wage will impact workers. But it's very positive that it's happening on a state-by-state -state level rather than jamming something through at the federal level. So federal level or state-by-state -state level? Or? Uh, I would still absolutely favor an increase to $10.10 on the federal level. I mean, Even though costs of living are different in every state? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, Just checking. Um, and I also think, I think it's actually interesting that some of the increases have come in states like Arkansas where the cost of living is very low. Um, I think that, I mean, if, we had, if it had even kept pace with inflation in the last 40 years, it would be higher than $10.10. Um, and some of our some of our greatest our greatest era of prosperity in the 50s and 60s was when we had a much stronger thriving middle class with higher minimum wage, more unionization, um, building from the middle out as opposed to the top down as um, many Republicans like to see it. So I would absolutely favor a federal increase. All right, and that is going to be our last word with our panel today. Thank you both so much. That was very lively and very <laughs> fun. Um, well, Capitol Hill is not the only place in D.C. that will see new leadership come next year. At City Hall, Muriel Bowser will be sworn in as the new mayor. Bowser earned more than 53 percent of the vote, beating her closest opponent, independent candidate David Catania. Also in D.C., voters decided, as we already mentioned, overwhelmingly to legalize marijuana use and possession in the district. However, the measure still faces federal oversight, and Congress could upend the city's decision. Some Republicans in the House have already objected. Earlier, Crossfire's Andrew Desiderio sat down with Washington Post reporter Mike DeBonis to talk about D.C.'s own politics. All right, thanks, Mike, for being here. Uh, so first, can you tell me how Mayor-elect Bowser is going to be different from incumbent Mayor Gray? Uh, great question, Andrew. Well, you know, the, the, tr the truth is, is that I don't know that there's going to be a whole lot of really obvious differences. I think it's going to be more about uh, the uh, type of people that she recruits to her administration. I think stylistically, her and uh, Vince Gray have a lot in common. They both ran on trying to bring different communities together, uniting the city. Uh, Vince Gray's slogan was one city. For Muriel Bowser, it's all eight wards, basically two sides of the same coin. So not, not expecting a lot of really big radical changes. She did say that she was going to sort of tweak some gray initiatives, including uh, rewriting the, uh, the the boundaries for the public schools in the city. But other than that, not seeing any big, big major uh, course corrections. Great. So uh, David Catania, the independent challenger who really um, was the only one who had a real chance to beat Bowser, sure. he only got about 35 percent of the vote. Um, do you think he could have done anything differently that would have propelled him to victory, or is Bowser always just the inevitable winner to you? I mean, I don't think it was inevitable. I think that it was a, a, a genuinely competitive race. He was just unable to overcome a lot of disadvantages you have as not not being the Democratic nominee. Um, what he, you know, what could have changed the outcome of this election is if 
I think a couple of things, if he'd had more money to communicate directly to voters, um, you know, he ended up relying very much on word of mouth, on earned media, meaning, you know, newspaper stories and television coverage. Um, he couldn't blanket the city in mail the way that uh, Muriel Bowser did. He didn't run uh, broadcast television ads in the same way that Muriel Bowser did. Right. And that was, he just, he didn't have the resources to do that. The other thing he could have done, perhaps uh, more could have been done to sort of, you know, make people doubt Muriel Bowser. Uh, you know, he, he was very aggressive in questioning her qualifications and her record. Uh, and uh, tried to uh, tried to you know go negative as they say. Um, he I don't know that he was t t terribly effective in that, and you know part of that can be attributed to Muriel Bowser just being a very careful candidate and uh, avoiding mistakes. Right, and um, Catania was of course campaigning pretty hard in Ward Seven and Eight, east of the Anacostia River. But Muriel Bowser ended up being victorious. She got over seventy percent of the vote in both both of those wards. Right. Um, but Catania himself, he won wards two, three, and six. So what do you think he did well in those areas? And what do you think he could have done better maybe right. in the Anacostia neighborhoods that Bowser overwhelmingly won? Wards two, three, and six, he had a, you know, he had a demographic advantage. Um, these are, you know, these are voters who, you know, do consume a lot more uh, media. They read the paper. They were able to learn more about his message without uh, David Catania having to spoon feed it to them through mail and through radio ads and all, all sorts of different things. So he was communicating with them more directly. And that's where really his base of support is and, and was are in those communities. So you get more word of mouth, you get more sort of social affinity uh, among Catania voters. In seven and eight, you know, the, you know, the, there's, uh, you know, a big premium on uh, a re having a real get out the vote field operation. And there was never any evidence that he really developed that. You know, mm -hmm. Muriel Bowser had hundreds of, of vans taking people from their homes to polling to places. Polls, yeah. uh, you know, that never happened. You know, David Catania never did that. Um, he was, you know, relying on uh, people of their own volition going out to vote. You know, maybe with a phone, the help of a phone call or or something like that. Yeah. That in some parts of the city, that's not enough. You have to, you, as they say, knock and drag. You have to get people. Mm -hmm to the polls. Right, and I want to move on real quick to uh, legal marijuana in the district. It was, of course, overwhelmingly approved by um, people who voted yep. in the election on Tuesday. Uh, but Congress does have the power to block it. Republicans in Congress have said they might uh, they might try to upend the city's decision, but Rand Paul, who might take over the powerful Senate subcommittee that oversees the district, has said he might just let it go and, and you know, say D.C. has the right to do what it wants. So what chance do you think Congress has of really upending this decision? Um, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen through the appropriations process. Um, you know, it's very difficult for uh, them to actually overturn the initiative when it gets sent to Congress, mm -hmm. or the or the subsequent leg legislation that establishes the uh, sales and taxation regime. Just because that requires both houses of Congress to vote in favor of a resolution and the president to sign it, I've seen no indication that the president is going to sign it. Um, but putting a, an appropriations measure onto the bill that would restrict the city's ability to spend funds on it, that would be somewhat easier. In fact, that the, the Republican House successfully attached that to a budget bill that they passed this year. Right. Um, that could happen. Um, it certainly make, complicates matters f uh, to have Rand Paul saying these things. Um, what it's going to come down to, I think, is a matter of priorities, both for the Republican Congress and for President Obama. If uh, the Republican P Congress thinks that this is something that they want to fight for during spend, uh, negotiations over a spending bill, right. then you know, chances are they might be able to get that. You know, President Obama may not consider that a priority when it comes to everything else that he wants to see in uh, the spending authorization for his last two years. Mm -hmm. So. You know, the question is, is where does this fall on the Republican list of priorities with everything else that they want to do and sort of squeeze out of uh, President Obama in these in these next two years? Right. Well, it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Mike, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Mike DeBonis of The Washington Post. Thanks to both Mike and Andrew. After this break, Spilled Milk, our wrap-up of Late Night Comedy. Stay with us. Wonderful academic institution with a fine athletic tradition. Patricio Garino throws it down with two hands. Wonderful city. It's a great place to go to school. Keaton Savage open down the right side. We'll go and dunk it with his right hand. 
Not just the family, it's a whole community. Armwood dunks it with 1.9 seconds left. Armwood, a thunder slam. 81-80, George Washington. A huge victory for the Colonials. Welcome back. During our panel discussion, a team of fact checkers was monitoring our debate. Andrew Desiderio joins us once again, this time to fill us in on what we missed. Andrew? Thanks, Kevin. Let's do a quick fact check of our debate today. Just a small thing for Eric, our liberal debater. Eric said that minorities and women have been trending away from the Republican Party. However, according to the exit polls from the midterm elections, Hispanic voters favored Democrats by 10 points fewer than they did in 2012. The Democrats' advantage over the GOP for women voters also went down from a 12-point advantage in, the, in 2012 to five points this time around. Also, the GOP won the most number of black voters since 2006. So these numbers do not quite fit the narrative that minorities and women are trending away from the GOP. That's it from the Fact Check Desk. Kevin, back to you. All right, thanks, Andrew. And we now turn to Spilled Milk, our wrap-up of the best of late-night political comedy. It's time for a midterm spilled milk. No milk today, my love has gone away. The bottle stands so long, I set the love to die. It was a great night. It was a great night for the fresh new face of the GOP, Mitch McConnell. <laughs> a face so fresh, it hasn't even grown lips yet. Duma <laughs> and China's National People's Congress, now solidly Republican. <laughs> the Blue Man Group, now the Red Man Group, having lost... <laughs> Two of three men. Children will now learn valuable life lessons from Red's Clues. The only territory, <laughs> the only territory Democrats retained is that painful sexual frustration will still be known as blue balls. That's right. D.C. now stands for Dank Chronic. <laughs> and thanks to this new law, we are never going to get Lincoln off that damn couch. <laughs> And if anyone needs to take the edge off after last night, it is this guy. So I say, go for it, sir. Appoint yourself commander in spleef. <laughs> You're looking at two years with the Republican House and Senate. What's the worst that could happen? You get high and nothing gets done. <laughs> you get high and maybe get paranoid that Congress is out to get you. You know, the White House has a movie theater and a bowling alley. I say it's time to tear up Michelle's organic kale patch and plant some Skunk Force One. <laughs> and if you ever, sir, if you ever get the munchies, the Secret Service has proven that the Domino's guy can just jump over the fence. <laughs> All right, and that does it for this episode of Colonial Crossfire. For all the latest political updates at any time, be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. For all of us here at GWTV, I'm Kevin Fry. Thanks for getting caught in the crossfire with us. We'll see you next time.